Hello and welcome. My name is Lori Rubin. I'm with ViewBug and I've got the wonderful Ben Ginsberg with us today. Hi, Ben. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Great. Well, we're very excited because Ben is actually judging one of our photo contests. It's called Spring 2015. But we're going to take a look at some of his gorgeous images, some of his action images, fine art. And then uh, we're going to talk about what he's looking for in a winning image. And then he's going to share a little experience with us. Uh, we were talking the other day and I said, you know, this would be a really good topic. So we're going to save that for last. So stick with us. I think that'll be very uh, <laughs> educational and hopefully not too entertaining, <laughs> right? <laughs> in this case. We'll see. <laughs> yes, we will see. Ben is an award-winning photographer, and he's also been honored and been in major publications. So Ben, tell us a little bit about your background and some of the wonderful things that you like to photograph. Well, I'm primarily a action sports and surf photographer, and I do a lot of fine art and commercial works as well. I was in 2013 honored as a finalist uh, top 50 overall in the Red Bull Loom action sports photography contest. Uh, we had about 30,000 entries from all over the world, which was a phenomenal experience. Uh, shortly after, I was a finalist in the Smithsonian annual photo contest, which was, again, another great opportunity. Uh, I've worked with major publications, uh, Surfer, Surfing Magazine, Surfing Life in Australia, uh, later up in Canada, so, um, Surfing Life in Australia, just Surfline, major, major web one, you know, that's all within surf. I've worked with a number of other companies and magazines and tourist guides and books. So uh, it, it's just been phenomenal. That's fantastic. Sounds like you've been doing a lot of busy work there. <laughs> I was looking through some of your images, Ben, and I mean, you are like a jack of all trades. You're doing, you know, fashion, action, product, uh, commercial faces here. I'm looking at your, your website right now. A fine art. So what is your really your favorite thing to photograph out of everything that you do? Well, I really love just telling stories with my imagery. And one of the great things about doing things in the sports world is you get to do a lot of action, but they also want to see lifestyles and broader images that really help focus in on what's going on, not just, okay, this peak of the action, but really telling the broader story. So you get to really find yourself in that too, which then lends to further doing fashion type imagery and which you're often in amazing locations. So you get to do a lot of fine artwork as well. And just once you're doing that, you look around in everyday things, you start to see sometimes a little differently. So maybe grab a macro lens and do some beautiful flowers that are out there. And we have a spring contest coming up. Um, maybe you just, you're in this beautiful, urban setting and it just it speaks to you or it's a sunset or sunrise even it's just depending on where you are what time where in the world and just always have your camera on you you can make something absolutely so ben you also gave us uh, five tips for surf and action in the view bug blog and that this is really a great you know set of tips here that he shows you what to do and um so i really encourage people to take a look at this Again, five tips for surf and action, and that's on the ViewBug website. So thank you for doing that for us. Of course. Glad to have the opportunity. Okay, now we have an opportunity to look at Ben's portfolio. We're going to look at his fine art section here and talk about a few of his images. Since he is judging spring 2015, uh, we're going to talk to him about what he's looking for in a spring image. Uh, what comes to mind? So here's a beautiful image of a water lily. Um, ben, why don't you talk a little bit about this, maybe your composition, what you're thinking about when you're pressing the shutter on this, this particular image. This is one of those ones where it's actually just a matter of being in the right time and right place. I find that that's often the case. You know, you try to set up, you try to prepare as much as you can, you try to make sure everything is ready to go at a moment's notice. And sometimes you come upon these found images and I was actually out with family when I took this shot and that we came across the fountain. This is actually, it was a large fountain and the beautiful lilies and the sun was just right. So I held everybody up for a while while I took two or three shots and I really wanted to make sure I played within the thirds on here. And I really liked how, you know, the 
bright and vibrant the lily was and how dark the contrast against the water surface with the reflection was. I had a polarizer on for, for this shot, so it really helped up some of the intensity. That's a really good tip, by the way, using a polarizer when you're going out to, to photograph, especially with water. Yep. Oh, absolutely. And I'm always a big fan of modifying light as it comes into your lens, kind of the old film techniques and still works perfectly with digital. There's so much you can do on the computer, but there's nothing quite the same as doing those old school techniques to really grab an image. Yeah. Great lighting on this. Very nice. Okay, we're going to take a look at uh, this tree really intrigued me here. It looks very old <laughs> and large. So where was oh, this yeah. taken? This is in Maui. This is a banyan tree. It's on the uh, waterfall height south of Hana on the island of Maui there. And it's just you walk up, you're probably about a mile in, and you get to just this little ridge top and here's this massive tree sprawling in front of you. And it was pretty bright that day, but under the canopy, it really filtered the light beautifully. And I was, once again, you know, I, I always kind of keep a filter pack with me and I was able to set up and get a good composition. And these trees, if you don't know about them, they, they can get huge, they can grow over an acre in size wow. coverage. And they send from their branches. Um, I don't actually know the, the technical name for it, but they're leaders down from the branches that form like secondary trunks and that helps it establish this large colony and it's just, they're amazing trees. That's incredible. You know, when I was looking through your images, this one made me stop and I think that's one of the things that you'd probably be looking for as well as those images that are very impactful and a little bit different. I mean, this this tree looks oh, like yeah. it's going to reach out and grab you. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Thank you. I was kind of going for that. It really, the way I tried to compose this one with the branch coming off on the right there as you're looking at it, just kind of mm -hmm. drawing you in or you said reaching out to get you. And I, I really do. I personally, the spring is such a broad, over-encompassing category almost if you really think about it. It could be so many things from snow melt to macro of uh, flowers to you know, young foals out in the wilderness to any sort of beautiful landscape or even just an urban scene with people changing how we dress and move in our activities. So I really look for something that jumps out, is well composed and kind of helps exemplify the change and new beginnings of spring. So just very uniquely seasonal, not something that sure it can be captured in August or in September, but something that really identifies itself as spring. Right. And I'm right. Really looking forward. I've seen some of the galleries. I'm really looking forward to see at the end here what our, our final choices are and the creativity people have. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's kind of it's a great thing when you have a category that's so open. But again, like you said, it encompasses so many things, which, which is a good thing. But um, but yeah, you know, it's going to be really exciting to see what what comes out of that for sure. Um, this was really intriguing. I love how you got down low. Maybe this was with a macro, but instead of that normal wide angle, you know, shot of the ocean, you really got in this tight. Actually, with a three hundred millimeter lens. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I um, I often shoot in the water. I often have stuff in my water housing. This instance, I did not, and I didn't want to get wet. So this is taken at the wedge in Newport Beach, and it's a heavy shore breaking wave. And it's a very, very steep embankment going from the high tide line down to the water's edge. So as the big waves are filling in, it crashes and it sprays. And sometimes that spray can be 12 feet tall and drench the people standing at the edge. So I, I shoot there all the time. I made sure I was far enough back and I put on the big zoom lens, laid down on the sand and you know, waited for that timing. That's great. I love this. The little water droplets over here on the right is great. <laughs> Okay, we're going to kind of scroll through a few of his other images. Now, um, I, I'm just really curious about this one. Where You must have been standing in the water with your camera. Oh, um, I was swimming in the water on this one. Let's talk about this one here. I really love the, the colors and the shapes of the rocks. So this one is uh, down in San Onofre State Park at a near a surf rate called Lower Trestles. And it's a very famous surf wave, actually, uh, within the, the surf world, if you are involved in that and actually as far as um, 
conservation as well. There's been a lot of activity with the Surfrider Foundation and trying to protect this area from development with a highway that could potentially change the uh, sand flows down from the river. And it's there are there is a little sandbar that kind of shifts and moves off of it. It's primarily a cobblestone reef, which is rare to have in, in Southern California, especially an actual reef break that's a point break. And at low tide, it drains out and you start to see the cobblestone reef expose. And they're just these, you know, they're bowling ball size. And there's these smooths over thousands of years. And it's just, it's a beautiful contrast with the waves crashing through and the sand and just there, you know, because it was just, a, you know, momentarily wet, having the waves crashed over them, the tide draining out, they're still beautifully vibrant. And obviously, water helps bring out the color. You see when they do TV and movies, when they're shooting a lot of scenes, they'll wet down the pavement or the rocks to help bring out color and things. And nature did it for me here. Sure did. Just beautiful colors. Love that. Let's take a look at a couple more of your action uh, images because I just love your water images. That's just fantastic. Karen, take a look at this. Oh, my goodness. And actually seeing it through a wave. That's amazing. It's always fun playing the waves. Uh, it must be, um, you must get tossed around quite a bit, though, after the wave crashes oh, over yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a time so you can punch through the back there, but uh, you can get thrown, you can get uh, flipped over, people get hurt. So it's definitely not something to do if you are unfamiliar with waves and shore breaking waves. And even if you are, getting in position is a lot harder than people often think. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's worth a while. Definitely. Yeah, sometimes you got to take that risk to get the shot. Looks like you're doing that here. <laughs> yeah, that one's up at Mavericks. Uh, that's uh, this big one here. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Half Moon Bay. Uh, you know, that's a 30 foot wave. I was on a boat in the channel. Wow, incredible. Okay, let's take a look at some uh, beautiful flowers here. Uh, this is a cherry blossom tree. Is that correct? Um. Yeah, I believe so. This is in Milan, Italy. Mm, beautiful. It was in, uh, this past spring, actually. And just you know, I happened to be there when everything was in bloom. Um, Beautiful. And we actually had a little bit overcast sky, but it really made as if the whole sky was a giant diffuser. So I was able to really get a good contrast between the colors without it being too blindingly bright. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Okay, let's look at a couple more sunsets here. This is very nice. Beautiful colors. Yeah, and a wind farm. These are just, you know, I don't know if people, some people realize how big these things are, but if you stand oh, underneath them, they're huge. The blades on those are about the length of a football field. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. They're a couple hundred feet long. Wow. What, what area was this at? This is in Palm Springs. Okay. California. Yeah. There's a giant solar farm, or sorry, not solar farm, wind farm there. They've been doing stuff there for 30 years. So they have some of these modern new ones and they still have some of the old original ones in operation. They're replacing them with the more efficient technology, but some of them have the old, you know, wire frames, towers going up, as opposed to these, you know, mm -hmm. almost like masts on a ship they look like. Yeah. Yeah. They're kind of eerie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's a beautiful macro where you're just getting inside. Everything else is kind of, you know, out of focus on purpose so that your uh, yep. your eye is right here in the center. For flowers, can you give us any tips on taking good flower images? Um, you know, lighting is obviously very important. Uh, having a flower that actually really, you know, looks good. There are so many you think, oh, that's a beautiful flower. When you get in, you try to take a photo of it, you notice maybe there's a little tear in the petal or there's something hanging off of something, an element within it, or maybe something's actually broken off. Or you also, if it's outdoors, like this one was, this is a hibiscus near where I live. Um, sometimes, especially when you're trying to do macro, it gets windy out there and you're trying to compose a shot and either you can't focus because it's blowing around or you, you go to take your shot and it's a little blurred because what do you know? It's moving. So you're, you know, you've got to adjust accordingly or as great photographers do, you pick and choose your time and your day and you come back and it's not always immediately as you found it. Sometimes you got to wait for those right conditions. 
Oh, these are beautiful. Got a little backlit. You know, a lot of people are afraid to shoot into the sun, but actually creates this really nice rim light. It's beautiful. I really do. Um, I love getting the bokeh effect in the background. I love how you get some of the different uh, sunspots and, you know, flare and how it, you know, the shapes it creates with your aperture blades. I, I think that adds to the photo. I've never been afraid of that. I've been criticized in the beginning of my career for maybe not doing it correctly or doing too much of it, but eventually people find their stride and you if you keep by what you like and if it is truly a good image, other people will either see it or eventually see it. So just mm -hmm. you gotta keep doing what you like. That is a great tip right there. Fantastic. Okay, and then we'll end on one of your beautiful water images here again love these you know it looks like you were close up maybe again with your 300 millimeter i don't i'm not too sure but you're down low it's great i was down low this is uh in a little river inlet by me and they're little microwaves these are maybe three to four inches tall and mm -hmm. i was lying in the water on this one I, I didn't have my water housing i was getting wet and i was jumping out to make sure i kept the camera dry as i needed to <laughs> <laughs> no risk no reward again <laughs> These are fantastic. Okay, Ben, so we were talking the other day and there was something that happened that is one of the biggest fears that we all have. So why don't you tell us what happened <laughs> in your life and what you've actually done to maybe resolve it for the future? Sure. Well, we're talking about the dreaded hard drive crash. And I hate to say I've had a couple. I didn't fully learn from my lesson the first time. But, you know, you have on your local hard drive, you store a bunch of images and you try to think you have them backed up, but sometimes you're not as diligent as you thought you were and your hard drive crashes and you go to your backup and lo and behold, the images you thought weren't there. This instance in particular taught me to have multiple redundant backups because I actually, I no longer had anything on my local drive at this point. I had everything on an external drive and whether just from traveling around because you know I'm always on the go and this was back really before solid straight state drives were around and they're still they're much more affordable than they used to be but they're not very affordable these days they're, they're still more expensive but this was definitely one of the magnetic drives and bumping around traveling hiking moving you know plugging in on the go on the laptop and Eventually that drive failed and it was a big problem because I also had some logic board error in my computer at the same time, which meant I, I didn't realize it was going on. There was just a little issue that's happening and it meant that my automatic time machine backup wasn't going either. And I had seen a message and I thought I had solved it and I just, I hadn't followed up enough. So my drive crashed and my backup time machine wasn't available. So I I lost images from a couple years worth actually. It was really, really unfortunate. A really tough lesson. Some of you know what I thought at the time and I still think some of my best images. So it, it's kind of heartbreaking, but I've learned to be incredibly redundant. So I have my current working drive, which is an external drive. Every week I do a clone to backup of that. So I overwrite whatever was on that backup drive every week with the new one. And I try to stay around a one or a two terabyte drive. I don't need, it takes too long. You don't need to spend the money. Plus I like to keep it portable for the most part. So I keep those going, I back them up. Uh, I also have a wireless backup that automatically does not only everything on my, my hard drive, on my local drive for my computer, but the drives I have plugged in. So. All my working drives from the years, I try to stick, you know, one drive per year. Um, when I was beginning, I wasn't, you know, I was just part-time in the very beginning, so it wasn't enough, so it was really, it was one drive for every couple of years, but it's really, it's one drive per year, roughly at this point, sometimes a little over. I back those up wirelessly, and I also have an off-site backup because it hasn't happened yet, but I've learned to be very precautious. Yes. And... <laughs> Just in case something not only happened to the drive, but at my location, if there's a fire in the house, if the place is, you know, burglarized, which, you know, obviously 
no one wants that, both for security, for your photos, but also your personal belongings. But if something should happen here on location, I now also have an off-site backup as well. And I, I don't really put stuff in you know, the generic cloud just because often it's either not enough capacity or I don't need it to be automatically synchronized to every device I own. I just need a secure backup. So I use one of the professional companies and you know, it, it works well for me. I'm, I'm happier and I, I'm more secure in what I do. Of course, there are times when I realize, oh no, I didn't do my, my backup this week or maybe something has happened with my computer so maybe my automatic backup isn't going when it should. So you've got to be diligent. I, I set reminders on my phone. I set reminders on my calendar. I leave post-it notes around. <laughs> just, you know, do what you can. It, it's going to happen at some point to everyone. Hopefully when you do, it's not very much. It's recoverable or it's just maybe your latest round of edits and all you have to do is re-edit some work, which is a bit of a pain, but it's not the end of the world. Losing your originals is bad. Yes. And do what you can to mitigate that disaster. Yeah. Great advice. Thanks, Ben. Really appreciate that. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing your, your life here and your portfolio, your beautiful images, and what you're looking for in a winning image for the Spring 2015 Viewbug Contest. So thanks so much, Ben. Really appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.